indeed. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Sovereign God, Lord, I pray right now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Bless him, Lord. I pray right now that you would use me, Lord, like you've never used me before. Release your preaching power. Allow your people to be edified. And I pray that you alone would be glorified. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Today I want to uh, speak to you from the subject, the sun does shine. All right amen. now. The sun does shine. How many of y'all have ever watched the Maury Povich show? Come on, don't act like y'all. I know it's a shameful thing to admit. I know most of us who watch it, we always claim that we watched it by accident or somebody else was watching it and we just happened to come into the room while they was watching it because we don't watch that kind of stuff, right? But I remember, here's my excuse. This is my excuse. When I used to work for Transit, every day I would come into the locker room and Maury Povich would be on every single day. Every, every morning they had Maury playing in the, in the locker room and at some point in every show you would hear Maury scream out those fateful words that made his show so famous. Yes. It was either you are or you are, or you are not. not the father. Amen? Yeah, I know. See, more people who was watching it didn't have their hands up. See what I'm saying? You see, all of y'all knew that, but I ain't see everybody's hand up. It's alright. Y'all lying in church on a Wednesday. It's alright. <laughs> Thank God we serve a forgiving God, amen? Amen, sir. <laughs> but as I look back on those days sitting in that locker room watching the reactions of the men and women who for some reason chose to subject themselves to the possibility of being embarrassed and humiliated yeah. on live television yeah. just so they could say they was on TV, I noticed that in almost every case, when the men were found out to be the actual fathers of these children, they all seemed to have the same reaction. Mm -hmm. Once faced with the reality of the truth, they would all stop yelling and being disrespectful. And in almost every case, this would, was followed by one of them saying to Maury, now that I know the truth, yes, Maury, I'm going to try to take care of my responsibility. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's good news because what it teaches us is that it is usually only after our denial has been exposed for what it is that we can experience a sense of relief and freedom from the lies that we tell ourselves all too often to hide from the difficult truths that life presents. And now I know that this may sound a little odd for an introduction to a sermon, but when we look at this text, it kind of reminds me of an episode of Maury because when we look at chapter eight contextually, we find Jesus having to deal with a group of people that are truly living in denial. Uh -huh. Let me show you what I mean. Is it all right if I teach it a little bit before I preach it? Teach it, teach it. Amen. This chapter opens with Jesus having to deal with the religious leaders confronting him about a woman they claim to have caught in the act of adultery. Yeah. Which is kind of funny in itself when you read the story because the first question you must ask is, how did they catch her in the act by right. herself? Right. You do know that it is literally impossible to commit adultery all by yourself, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Where was the man that she was doing it with? Ah. I'm just saying. And that's how this chapter opens up. As some self-righteous scribes and Pharisees confront Jesus with the goal of, of discrediting Jesus' ministry by either trapping him into breaking the law or by exposing him as a false prophet because of their own unbelief. And it is this unbelief that has blinded them from seeing their own sinfulness and more importantly, from, Gene, from seeing Jesus for who he really is. And as we take a brief look at that first story in this chapter, we can see their motives clearly as they proceed to prove that it is not just it that, that they are seeking, but rather a way to find fault with Jesus. Yes. And that is because when they confronted Jesus about this woman, they presented him with a scenario that was designed to trap him. Yes, you sir. see, if Jesus said that the woman should be spared, then he would be accused of breaking the law. That's right. But if Jesus agreed that she would be stoned, it would discredit Jesus' message of forgiveness and his bold willingness to be a champion for those most oppressed and marginalized at the hands of the Roman government, uh -huh. who relied on the cooperation of their hand-picked Jewish leaders to oppress their own people in return for a semblance of power and a fistful of Roman cash. So rather than answer their question directly, Jesus instead bends down and begins writing in the sand. And when he stands up, he says, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Yes. 
Now all of the women, when he stands up, he notices that all of the women's accusers have left the scene, which made me wonder exactly what Jesus was writing. And I can't help but think that the reason they all left was because Jesus was writing all the names of those standing there who were guilty of the same crime they were accusing her of. Amen? Now, I don't know about you, but that sure sounds like denial like to me. Yes. But it really shouldn't come as a surprise because that's what self-righteous people do. Mm, mm, mm. But Jesus is such a loving savior that he never gives up on his people. The second part of the chapter finds Jesus still trying to enlighten the Jews that it is only through him that they can find true freedom. Jesus proclaims that he is the light of the world, but because the Jewish leaders are so blinded by their self-righteousness, instead of receiving this, they accuse Jesus of bearing false witness. Talk about living in denial. Yeah. See, sometimes when the truth is right in front of you, it's hard to admit it. And just like those men and women that we make fun of on the Maury Show, it's often a whole lot easier to lie to yourself than it is to face your own mess. So as we read further into this chapter, Jesus starts to get through to some of them when he warns them that some of them won't realize who he really is until it's too late. Uh -huh. He tells them that some of them won't see the truth until they realize that the one who came to free them is the same one that they are going to hand over to be crucified. And then the text says that finally, some of them begin to believe, but not all of them. Some of the Jews take exception to Jesus referring to them as slaves. And they come for Jesus, challenging him by saying, we are the children of Abraham, and we have never been slaves to anyone. Well, now, did I say denial? Because that's what self-righteous people do. Yes. Have you ever lied to yourself so much that you started to believe it? Believe your own lie. You know, like when it's not enough just to be wrong, but some people got to be wrong and strong. <laughs> Amen. Apparently, these Jews had forgotten or chose to forget that they had been enslaved in Egypt, conquered by the Assyrians, the Babylonians and the Persians, not to mention the fact that while they were standing in front of Jesus, they were presently living under the control of the Roman government. Yes. I think that's what people would call selective memory, amen? Uh-huh. And considering that this is my awful week, that just goes to show how dangerous it can be to become so disconnected from your history to the point that you lose sight of not only who you are, but whose you are. All right. It's like Harriet Tubman once said, I freed hundreds of slaves. And I could have freed hundreds more if only they knew they were slaves. And if we're paying attention, black people, we are witnessing a nation currently living in denial. Yes. As we wake up every morning and watch news show after news show decrying the, the damage that the Trump administration is doing in terms of rolling back regulations that save lives, encouraging law enforcement to be more aggressive in dealing with our people, proving daily that black lives don't, don't matter, separating children from families, feeding black and brown children lead for breakfast, inspiring hatred and empowering neo-Nazis and white supremacy, and yet, with all of the evidence that proves we live in a nation founded on inequality, all you hear on the news is, this is not who we are. Yeah. Deny. And so, it is at this point in the text that Jesus has had enough of the nonsense, but because he is such a loving and forgiving savior, he tries to show them not only the error of their ways, but he also shows them the way out of their mess. Uh -huh. This lesson is not just for them. It is a lesson for us all. You see, since they can't seem to wrap their minds around the thought that they have been and still are slaves to their sinful self-righteousness, Jesus breaks it down for them and us like this. Jesus shows them that in order to attain true freedom, that there must be a progression in the growth of the believer. He then shows them that the freedom that they think they have is based on a false pretense. And finally, he shows them that the way to receive the promise of true freedom is only through him because he is the only one who truly represents it. Now, I'm going to lift these three points and then I'm going to take my seat. But I'm going to show it to you this way. You see, in verses 31 and 32, Jesus says, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Yeah. You know, one of the things I hate to hear people say when they keep repeating the same mistakes over and over is when they excuse their behavior by saying, it's a process. Yeah, God knows my heart. <laughs> well, I hate to be the one to bust your bubble, but it's not a process unless you are making some progress. Amen? All right, sir. You know, that's just like people who always say, knowing is half the battle. When have you ever seen a battle won at halftime? You got to finish the game, amen? You see, it's not just enough to believe because that is shallow faith. And that's why some of us fall apart when all hell breaks loose in our lives. 
because we don't continue to abide in Jesus. You see, it's not enough to walk down the aisle and say you give your life to Christ and think without being intentional about developing and strengthening your relationship with God that you will be able to become strong enough to withstand the attacks of the enemy. So we must progress in our spiritual growth if we truly want to be free from the bondage of our self-righteousness. And we do that by committing ourselves to the process of nurturing that relationship through regular attendance on Sundays to hear the preach word, by reading our Bibles daily, attending Bible studies, and by creating new positive relationships through fellowshipping with mature saints who can help lead and walk alongside us in our journeys. I mean, how many of y'all know someone who's been going to church for 30 years and is just as mean and nasty as they were 30 years ago? Come on, sir! You know how they got that way? By refusing to look at themselves honestly and instead focusing all their energy on looking at the faults of others. Amen? And then Jesus teaches us about the pretense of freedom. In verses 33 and 34, Jesus shows them that the reason they are not getting it is because they are putting their trust in their lineage to Abraham rather than in their faith in God. The Jews had a sense of entitlement because they believed that since they were descendants of Abraham, they were automatically entitled to the inheritance of God's promise. Mm -hmm. But Jesus reminded them that even Abraham was not justified by his bloodline, but by his abiding faith in God. Remember that Abraham was tested by God yes. and proved his faithfulness by showing his willingness to give up his son Isaac as a sacrifice to God. And that means that we as a people of God must never lose sight of who we are really putting our faith in. We must resist the urge to allow ourselves to be seduced by false or incomplete gospels that tickle our ears and instead remain faithful to the God who despite our disobedience has always been faithful to us. Yes. And lastly, Jesus gives them the promise of freedom. Uh -huh. In verses 35 and 36, Jesus puts it all into perspective when he explains to them that if they continue in their self-righteous denial, they will never truly be free. But he offers them something better than slavery. He offers them the same thing that he offers to all of us. Jesus offers sonship. And for clarity, that term also includes daughtership too. Amen? And that's good news, y'all, because Jesus puts it this way. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. Uh -huh. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, yes, sir. you will be free indeed. Yes. See, Jesus is saying to all of us that he is the promise of freedom. Yes. You see, a slave does not have the same permanent status in the household as does, as does the son of the head of the household because a slave can be sold. And a slave has to depend on someone else to be set free. Yes. The son, on the other hand, has a place in the household forever. And he even has the authority to carry out his father's commands, which is why Jesus can boldly say that if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. indeed. And freedom from sin is a gift that can only be given by the one who has the authority to give it. Amen? Amen. And if we continue to abide in him, rather than acting like we are entitled to God's blessings and instead humble ourselves to God through our faith in his son, then we too can be called sons and daughters of God and receive the freedom that can only come through our faith in Jesus Christ. So the question is, if Jesus as the Son has authority to make believers free, then as children in the household of God, don't we as believers have authority and power to set others free as well? Sir. I believe the answer to that question is yes. And like the saying goes, membership has its privileges, huh. but it also comes with responsibility. All right. And Jesus gives us that command in the Great Commission when he tells his disciples, to go forth, baptizing all nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, too many of us have bought into the same kind of God of those unbelieving Jews in that our perception of God is often shaped on the narrow experiences of our daily circumstances or on outdated and uninformed oppressive theologies that were passed down to us to bind rather than free us. And when we do that, we make the fatal mistake of trying to serve a God that is way too small to save any of us. Let me see if I can make that live. Back in the day, Dr. Youngblood told us a story about a banquet he attended with a group of pastors. As they were preparing to order, the waiter came and asked each of them what to drink, what they wanted to drink. Several pastors ordered soda and juice, and one pastor ordered a glass of wine. 
Dr. Youngblood said he ordered his usual Jack Daniels. So when the food came, the pastor who ordered the wine was asked to bless the food. And he took the glass of wine, held it behind his back, and began to pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, bless this food. Uh -huh. The hands that prepared it may nourish our bodies in Jesus' name. Amen. And when he was done, Dr. Youngblood looked at him and said, I don't know how small your God is, but my God is big enough to see behind your back. All I'm saying, church, is that we don't serve a petty God who is watching and waiting to punish us at every turn. No, we serve a God who is big enough and loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son to die Come on, while it. we were yet sinners. So now we know that if we truly desire to live in the freedom of Christ, I like that. we must progress in our spiritual growth, be intentional about the object of our faith, and if we surrender our will to the will of God, then we will receive the right to be called children of God with all the rights and benefits of the kingdom of God. But how many of y'all know that knowing better does not always result in doing better because it's so much easier to follow our own selfish will than it is to follow God? Yes, sir. No, it's not easy to stay the course from following God. And I know that life is hard, but I want to let somebody in here today know that nothing, and I mean nothing, that you or I have ever done will ever separate us from the love of God because it is God's desire that one day we all be free. Now I'm just about done, y'all, but before I take my seat, I want to leave you with this story. I'm currently reading a book written by a brother named Anthony Ray Hamilton. This is a true story about a black man who spent 30 years of his life on death row, sentenced to death for a crime he did not commit. Over the course of those 30 excruciating years, he watched as 54 men walked past his cell to be put to death while he awaited his own. Oh, he described death row as a place where the sun had stopped rising. And after 30 years of proclaiming his innocence, when he finally got justice and was exonerated by the courts on his final day in prison, he contemplated what he would say to the reporters when they asked, what he had to say after 30 years of confinement on death row. And he said he thought long and hard about it. But when he walked out of that prison and the reporters approached him, all he found himself being able to say is, the sun does shine. Woo! The sun does shine. And I just want to encourage somebody who may feel like it's too late to turn their life around by letting you know that while it is always darkest before the dawn, the sun, the sun does, does shine. shine. Come on, boy. You see, maybe you believe that you have done so much wrong that you are no longer worthy of God's salvation. But I want you to know that the sun does shine. And while Anthony Ray Hamilton was referring to the S-U-N, he could have just as easily been referring to the S-O-N because while he had been freed by the state after 30 years, what kept him alive was that, was that centered hope and his belief that God was with him every step of the way and the hope that God was just enough to sustain him for 30 years in a place where the sun had refused to shine. So be of good cheer, my brothers and sisters, because we serve a God who specializes in bringing life out of deadly situations. And I know that because I remember reading about a garden called Gethsemane where Jesus fell to his knees, struggling to finish the job that his father gave him to do. And the Bible said that he was so stressed out that his sweat was like blood pouring from his brow. Yes. And he said, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And he got up off his knees and he let them arrest him on that Friday. And the courts found an innocent man guilty and sentenced him to death. And that night they hung him high and they stretched him wide. He hung his head and for you and me he died. But that's not how the story ends because three days later yep. he rose again. And when he got up, he got up with all power in his hands. And because he got up, we have a chance to experience what true freedom is. And it is the true freedom that gives us the hope to say, because the S-O-N rose, the, -O the S-U-N still rises. And that is our hope today, y'all, because every time we refuse to give in to hopelessness, the sun still rises. Every time we resist hatred, the sun still rises. Yeah. Every time we succeed despite a system designed for us to fail, the sun still rises. Come on. Every time we walk by faith and not by sight, the sun, sun still, still rises. rises. Every time we speak life to each other, the sun still rises. 
And every time we choose God over ourselves, the sun still rises. And the sun still rises because he who the sun sets free is free indeed. Namaste, St. Paul. God bless you.